everyone here this morning. A word of welcome to those of you watching our video online. I give thanks for everybody that's a part of this worship service, and no matter online or in person, I invite us all into this time of prayer. Lord, your holy word is full of lessons and promises. We seek once again to learn from the lessons and to honor your promises. How we live shows our commitment to both. This we pray. Amen. An emergency room doctor was sharing stories once about the multitude of injuries that she had witnessed in the ER, and she got to laughing about some of the injuries that resulted from simple stupidity. She went on to tell the story of a guy who was brought to the ER with serious injuries to his face and his teeth. The doctor admitted she was appalled to learn what had happened. While intoxicated, this man had been driving around the neighborhood on his lawnmower, was lighting firecrackers off his cigarette and then throwing the firecrackers into the street. He was having a grand old time until he accidentally threw his cigarette and stuck the firecracker in his mouth. Ouch. Well, whether from our flawed nature or from our times of unwise decision-making, we as a species, even the best of us, have been known and are known at times to disappoint our Creator. The story of Noah and the flood is the culmination of a disappointment God had with us very early on in the creation story. The story of Noah and the flood is one of those biblical stories that we're so familiar with, we think we know the whole story. In fact, what we tend to think of as the story usually falls into one of two interpretations. The most common interpretation is very much a children's story of animals and rainbows. This is a story about God's love for animals two by two, and God's love shown for us each time we see a rainbow appearing on the bright side of a storm. You cannot have a rainbow without a little rain, right? The second common interpretation is a story most definitely not for children. In this interpretation, God is so angered by human rebellion that God floods the whole earth, wiping out nearly everything in a fit of divine rage. This is a story about a God whom you'd be crazy to want to have anything to do with, a God of wrath who is ready and willing to strike down sinners anywhere and everywhere. As is often the case when we seek to tell a story, we don't get it exactly right. Such is the case with the flood. Neither of these interpretations is the whole story, and neither contains the whole truth. A truer story is that God has a plethora of ways to call us back and to keep us in the harmony that God intends for us and for all of creation. You see, the entire flood narrative found in Genesis is the culmination of a story of increasing human sinfulness that actually begins in Genesis 3. Theologian Elizabeth Webb writes that early in Genesis, we first see that sin results in disharmony between humans and other creatures, between males and females, and between humans and their earthly labors. This disharmony intensifies throughout Genesis where we see the first mur murder, that of a brother against a brother. Beyond that, the disturbance we cause with God's harmony continues. Humanity becomes so broken that God regrets having created humanity in the first place. And God's regret is clear. God saw that every inclination of the human heart was continually evil. God is sorry because of the corruption of the beings that God made with such care and love. And God's heart 
In striking contrast to the evil of the human heart is grieved by our betrayal. God is pained by the brokenness of creation. It is then that God sends the flood, not as an act of revenge, but out of grief over the fracturing of right human relationship with God. And this is really important. The human betrayal of God's love and God's good intention has an effect beyond human beings. Human sin causes corruption throughout all of creation. And that is what is responsible for worldly destruction. How's that for an uplifting sermon? Well, don't despair. There's good news to be found. Always good news with God. God doesn't wipe away God's creation and then just walk away. The flood is one step in a story of recreation. God washes the earth clean and then both God and the earth begin again. Just like in the very beginning of Genesis, filled with stories of God's creation, the flood plays a big part in God's recreative abilities. This gets at why I chose to share this scripture reading on the first Sunday of Lent. Often the scripture lifted up on the first Sunday of Lent is the baptism of Jesus and then Jesus spending 40 days in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. The 40 days of temptation is a natural connection to our 40 days of Lent. That story is certainly worthy of our reflection during Lent or any time of the year when we read it. Still, Lent is also a time when we are called to turn toward new ways those ways being the ways of the Lord. The life that God offers us after the 40 days of the flood is a new way, reacclimated back toward the Lord. God does not create new beings, but God begins again with a remnant of the beings that God had first created in the beginning. And God is so committed to this recreation, that we get a covenant to mark this newly restored relationship between God and all of God's creatures. Make note, this covenant is entirely of God's doing. God enters into an eternal covenant with all of creation without requiring creation to do anything in return. God's establishment of this covenant is done even with God being fully aware that the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth. In other words, the flood, while it has cleansed, it has not cleansed the human heart of sin, which we'll see more of later in Genesis. But God already knows this, and God enters into the covenant anyway. That divine heart that was so grieved by human wickedness is now moved to seek another way to reach us. So God promises Noah and his descendants and every creature on the earth to never again destroy all creation with the waters of a flood. And the sign of the covenant that God makes with us is the bow in the clouds. Now we have made this bow in the clouds into a rainbow and that's okay. Everybody likes a rainbow. We just sang about the God of the rainbow. But it is important to know that in terms of biblical interpretation, the Hebrew word is simply bow. And except for this passage in Genesis and one reference in Ezekiel, the bow used in the Bible always means a weapon of war, as in a bow and an arrow. Thus, with this covenant, An instrument of war is being laid aside by God, signifying a retirement from battle. Now the bow will serve as a sign of God's promise. Destruction is off the table as God reclaims us, all of us, as God's people. This all means that God is willing to go to whatever length necessary to save us. God will seek us despite of and perhaps because of God's knowledge of our sin, 
that keeps us from fully embracing who we are as God's creatures. Regardless of whatever dwells in our hearts, and God knows what dwells in our hearts, God will not give up on loving us. God loves us. God loves us. As it was in the beginning, so it is now and always will be. What a fantastic promise. But that is God's side of the story. What about our side? If God is committed to loving all of us and all of creation for all time, what are we committed to? As this season of Lent gets underway, that's a question we should be considering. Unfortunately, it doesn't take long to see that we might not be very committed to the idea of love. Just take a look around at Ukraine, Israel, and Gaza, and other places in the world where violence is rampant. Of course, the world stage is not the only place to find such violent examples. In our own communities, in our own lives, we hear of acts every day that speak of a disregard for others, a shooting at a Super Bowl rally and a fist fight on a flight to Hawaii are just two examples from this past week showing a lack of love for our neighbors. Somewhere in seminary I discovered through our passage in Genesis that while God makes a commitment to care for us following the flood, going so far as establishing a covenant with us, we don't come close to making that same kind of commitment to ourselves. It doesn't have to be that way. All things are possible with this God who loves us. There was a little boy who had been adopted and his parents wanted him to know the full story. When they thought he was old enough to understand, they told him about his mother who gave birth to him but could not care for him and how they were able, not able, to give birth to a baby, but they wanted to be parents and they wanted to be his parents. They assured the boy of their love and that God loved the three of them as a family. One day on the way home from school, the little boy asked if he had been born in God's belly. His father patiently recounted how the three of them had become a family. After driving a bit further, the dad asked the son if he had any more questions. The boy responded, oh no, I remember. I wasn't born in God's belly. I was born in God's eyes. We all are born in the eyes of God. We are all loved by God, each one of us. You, me, even the guy on the lawnmower, the God of Genesis, the great creator and the recreator made us, cares for us, and loves us for all eternity. Now we are called by Jesus in Matthew to recognize that love, to honor that love, to embrace it, to embody it, and to share that love with others, heart, mind, and soul, the very same way that God first loves us. Every day is a great day to celebrate that love, but especially during the season of Lent, we are to spend time reflecting on God's love for us and for all of creation. The words I often use at Ash Wednesday and at the beginning of Lent are, turn from your ways and turn toward the ways of the Lord, the ways of love. So today, with God, we begin again, turning toward love. May it be so now and always. And let us pray. Almighty Creator, you go to great lengths to keep our story moving forward. We pray this day to go to great lengths to keep our story, as well as the story of your magnificent creation, always moving forward. With hope, we pray in your name. Amen.